Cucumbers with Anxiety. Chapter 6 My eyes slowly opened and the featureless familiar ceiling of my bedroom faded into view. A cold breeze brushed against my cheek as the curtains bulged from the pressure. Something was different. First of all, my eyes weren't tired. Every morning when my eyes open, they immediately beg to be closed. The light from the world is always too oppressing and jarring for a mind that would rather still be asleep. This particular morning, however, my eyes opened once and didn't need threats of violence to remain in that state. Second of all, it wasn't a battle to breathe, which could only mean that there was no mountain of covers on top of me. A quick glance by eagerly obedient eyes confirmed this. Lastly, my overly vigilant eyes took it upon themselves to take a quick glance at my alarm clock, which told me that it was close to 8am. What an extremely early time to be awake and not immediately dive under the covers again. I was half surprised to find that the sun was indeed shining at this time in the morning, although the overall grey gradient of my room made me think twice. I found it shockingly easy to swing my legs off the bed and walk to the window. I peer through the window to find a light overcast sky, with a comfortable cold breeze to match. I am going to love today. I always found the heat of summer to be inescapable, and rather preferred winter. I guess it fits more with my lifestyle. Winter mesh as well with sitting on the couch curled up in a blanket with steaming cup of coffee and consuming unhealthy amounts of television. Some people would say that you could escape the heat of summer by going outside and perhaps taking a dip in a pool. Those people don't know me at all. I floated down the stairs to the kitchen. Before my thoughts caught up with my body, I had opened the cupboard where I keep my prized collection of cereals. All my cereals were really just different shapes of chocolate-flavored pellets filled mostly with air. I'll eat anything chocolate-flavored. I stared at the various primary colored boxes making promises they don't keep but are just vague enough to be legally safe until I realized that I wasn't in the mood for any one of them. I know cereal isn't supposed to fill you with excitement and give you an unwavering smile while you eat them, despite what those unnerving commercials might lead you to believe, but I was yearning for a bit more excitement in the start of my day. I slammed the cupboard closed and instead headed for the fridge. Inside I found a couple of eggs, which didn't float in water and cheese that was still vaguely yellow. I popped a pan on the stove and cracked eggs into it with some grated cheese. I found a toaster hidden in the back of the pantry and blew the dust out of it. I sank some bread slices in, who were probably surprised they weren't just having peanut butter spread over them. I hunted through my freezer and found some pork sausages that might have been bought before the renaissance. As long as they were kept frozen, they'll be fine, right? Right? I rolled the sausages around in a pan in some oil until they couldn't be used to bludgeon someone. If someone yelps at bread jumping out of a toaster, but nobody is around to hear it, did it really happen? I spread raspberry jam over the toast and once the sausages and omelette reached the same viscosity, I deemed them both ready for consumption. My tummy grumbled in anticipation for something that isn't dust with milk. I made coffee to accompany my magnum opus and placed all of it on a tray and carried it to the living room. I didn't even know I owned trays. I placed the tray on the coffee table and sank into my beloved couch. I had to take a deep breath and experience the aroma that now permeated through the house. It's amazing how much a smell could change your perception. For months my house smelled stale and stuffy, but now the smell of real food and the oil burns on my forearm filled it with color. Not just metaphorically. It really seemed as though a previously bland house was given some color back, some life. It was like staring at a painting of roses for months, but suddenly you can smell the roses, and you notice how red they always were. I dug in without noticing that I neglected to turn on the TV. I bit into the toast, the jam being thick and sweet. I finished both pieces before the omelette disappeared in no time at all. I felt fulfilled in a strange way, as if a long lingering hunger was sated for the first time. I ate mightily at the wedding, but that wasn't it. I wasn't hungry for food. 
I was hungry for my food. I put effort into this meal. I could taste it, and my tummy rewarded me for it. My happy loud chewing echoed off the walls until there were only the sausages remaining. I nearly guzzled down all of it before I felt a cold nose against my leg. Peter had suddenly appeared out of thin air and was giving me puppy eyes. I guess he couldn't help it, since he was a puppy. And he had eyes. Oh, now that I have some tasty pork sausages, I'm suddenly interesting again, huh? I filled your bowl this morning. Where was little Peter then? Little Peter was nowhere to be seen. But whilst wielding pork sausages good enough for the gods, little Peter doth appear. Bark! Excuses, my dear. Excuses are all I hear. Although I can hardly blame you. I'm pretty sure these sausages are provoking confused hunger in a three-block radius. Bark! Yeah, of course you're overflowing with compliments all of a sudden. You have an agenda. All you boys are the same. The compliments come a plenty, but you really only want one thing. My pork sausages. You have dog food, you know. It can't be bad. It's the expensive kind. Bark! Oh, you just want to cleanse your palate, huh? Fine. Just be careful with this, alright? It has cheese in it. You know you're watching your cholesterol. I flicked my last piece of sausage off my fork. Peter jumped up and did a backflip as he caught it. I saw the sausage at the edge of his teeth for a moment before it disappeared down his gullet. He returned to staring at me. Bark! I'm sorry. That was it. You need to learn to savor the taste, little one. Some things are too good to shove down your gullet like that. If you just shovel everything down, you're going to miss all the good stuff. People always gave me the strangest looks when I took minuscule bites out of my ice cream. But I learned something from a very young age. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, of bad tasting stuff in the world. Chocolate milkshakes don't exactly spring out of the ground, you know. Spinach springs out of the ground, and spinach tastes awful. If you compare it by weight, there is a lot more bad tasting stuff in the world than good. But that's just the thing, my tiny Peter. You should never compare it by weight. You're going to have to eat the spinach sooner or later. So when it comes, you shovel that horrible stuff into your mouth and afterward you just try your best to keep it down. However, when that chocolate brownie with chocolate mousse and chocolate sauce with pecan nuts on top comes, you gotta take your time. You need to get comfortable in your chair. Sit back, take a deep breath, and take the smallest bite you can. Don't let other people distract you with their stupid words and conversation. You're enjoying one of the rare sweet things life has to offer. They can wait. So chew as slowly as you can, swallow only when you have to, and let the taste linger before you take another bite. Spend as much time on the sweet things as possible. Spend as little time on the bad stuff as possible. Time is the only metric that really matters, because it's the only thing which isn't infinite. I know it sounds like there's a lesson in here somewhere, but I'm really just passionate about dessert. I got up and went to put my plates in the coffee mug in the dishwasher. I stared at them in the dishwasher for a few moments, as it just didn't seem right to put them there. I took them out and washed them by hand, tried and returned them to the cupboard. Around this time, I would usually return to my couch and spend the rest of my day there. But the thought of it just didn't sit right with me. I looked around the kitchen floor, seeing the coffee blotches on the white tiles, the single cereal pellets that weren't worth the effort to pick up when they fell. I found the broom in the broom closet, which made me feel dumb because I searched for it for half an hour. I swept the kitchen floor, gathered all the dirt, and threw it away. I couldn't help but let out a satisfied sigh as I threw out the dirt. It felt like a load off my mind, like I was cleaning something more than my kitchen. I busted out the mop, which I didn't find in the mop closet, and gave the kitchen floor a shining. When I was done, I felt the broom wink at me. Before I knew it, I was sweeping the entire lower floor. When that was finished, I felt so good I half expected the broom to light a cigarette. It would seem that cleaning has serious psychological benefits. I also found my earphones, 
which I lost six months ago under the couch, which also has psychological benefits. I used to put in these earphones every day when I went for a run in the morning. Damn, I used to be a different person. The blasting of music helped me escape from this world and usher in a new one. I could close my eyes and disappear into my mind. The breeze over a light coat of sweat was a cold, comfortable hug the world gave me every morning. Every step, every gasping breath, every racing heartbeat chipped at the darkness, and it slowly melted away. In that moment, all that existed was myself, the small piece of ground I was jumping off of, and the music. I was digging in my closet for tights and a tank top before even realizing it. In moments I was dressed in the perfect clothes to sweat into. My earphones were tightly lodged into my ear canals in a medically questionable manner, and I was ready to run. For some reason. My feet hit the pavement and I broke into a fast jog. Then I immediately slowed down because my everything was hurting. I could see the cars passing, the trees bending to the will of the wind, but I couldn't hear any of it. My mind existed within the music, the melodies rising and falling, the designed vocals laced with emotion. The music was hard and fast, just the way I liked it. All the singers sounded like they were mad at somebody. I don't know who they were mad at, but I'm glad that whoever made them mad did what they did because it resulted in some good tunes. I skipped a couple of songs until I found one with a female singer. I wish I could say it was musical preference, but that's not quite true. The thing is, I enjoy projecting myself into the music, imagining I'm on a stage singing my heart out to an audience of shouting fans. More often than not, someone from my past, who wronged me in some intentional or unintentional way, appeared at the very front of said audience, and I would pretend not to see them. It's a rather petty power fantasy, but I'm addicted to it. I dissolve into it and the scene plays out in my head crystal clear. I'm on a stage, bouncing around and singing the song pitch perfect. People below me. I find it hard to listen to music at all and not slip into this fantasy. Music, without exaggeration, is the reason I'm still alive. I could always rely on music to pull me out of my darkest depths when I needed it. I made it through some tough times by blasting it into my ears. At the same time, it's hard to describe what music really is. It is something universal, something that connects us all, something transcendent. There doesn't exist a civilization that didn't develop their own music with unique instruments, styles and voices. There doesn't exist a person that doesn't like at least one type of music. Music was always here long before we came into existence. We'd be quite arrogant to think we invented music. The truth is, we discovered it. Music is something fundamental to the universe. The universe is just gears, but music makes them turn. We connect to it, and through it, we can connect to each other. Words can communicate a message, music can communicate a feeling. When I listen to music, I connect to the singer, I hear the words, but I feel the intent behind them. When I'm down, I try to find music that describes how I'm feeling, because it's proof that someone, somewhere, at some point in their lives, felt exactly the same, and they survived. In that moment, I'm connected to someone else's heart, and in that moment, I don't feel alone, and only in that moment. I stumbled through the door sooner than I realized. The fantasy is so addictive I don't always notice the time flying by. But at some points you always have to make amends with reality. And the reality was that my body was screaming. My muscles complained fiercely with every movement I made. My lungs threatened to burn a hole in my chest. I was breathing so fast I was changing weather predictions. Despite all this, I felt amazing. Exercise is slightly masochistic in a way. The more you hurt afterward, the better you feel. It's because you know what that pain means. Progress can only be made through hardship. 
all that starts bitter and sweet. I panted into the kitchen and shoved my face under a running faucet for a full minute, gulping down whatever water happened to make it into my mouth. I sank down to the kitchen floor and gasped at breath. My skin was on fire, my head light, and I was just trying to not pass out. My eyes floated around the kitchen. It's funny how different things can look with a small change of perspective. The dark wood kitchen cabinets look so much more impressive from down here. I remember wiping the sweat off my brow and feeling like the queen of the world when I successfully fitted one of the cabinet doors, just for him to tell me that it was upside down. I felt so stupid, but he just laughed and hugged me. He kissed my cheek, and I thought he'd pull away because I've been sweating, but he kissed me anyway. It was such a small yet massive moment, because my internal instinct was telling me that I made a mistake, and I should quit because I'm never going to be able to do it. In his arms, my mistake seemed like it was part of the process. Hell, it was part of the progress. It was necessary. I fitted one door upside down, which means from now on I will check before I fit each one. My mistake seemed like it was the first step towards success, instead of a reason to turn back. Thinking about it like that made me feel like I could do anything I can imagine. It's funny how different things can look with a small change of perspective. After a while I realized I wasn't out of breath anymore. I ran upstairs to take a shower. Within moments blazing hot water covered my skin and washed off all the sweat. My skin was on fire before I entered the shower, but as the water ran over it, it responded. I felt the water more acutely than I usually do. It felt as if my skin was alive and not like I was just wearing it. I lathered my body with soap and washed my hair for about ten minutes. I haven't done that in a while. Perhaps now it'll obey gravity. A new person emerged from the steam of the shower. I felt lighter, more alert and awake than I have in a long while. I heard my tummy growl and looked down on it accusingly. I spoiled it once this morning and now it's getting all entitled on me? I jumped up and down and watched my belly whiplash back and forth. I dried myself off and headed back into my room. I reached into the back of the closet to find the prettiest underwear I own. I just feel better when I'm wearing pretty underwear, which never made sense to me. I don't exactly have anything planned of that particular variety, so nobody's really supposed to see it. The only way someone would is if I, by some freak accident, tripped and fell in line of sights of an active laser that only evaporates genes. If that were to happen, I'd be prepared with the prettiest underwear I own. Isn't it weird to be so prepared for the possibility of an accident? Is pretty underwear sort of like car insurance? I might have been pushing my luck, but I thought I should spend some of that energy on something productive. Do something today you'd be glad to have done tomorrow, is what I always said. I just decided to always be glad that I ate a massive bowl of ice cream the previous day. I walked into my living room and... passed my couch. I could feel it staring at me aghast. Instead, I sat down at my desk. The solemn raven was still staring at me, hiding its shame. I turned the page and brushed my hand over the clean and unsoiled page just revealed. I took out an array of felt pens and laid them side by side next to the sketchbook. I wrote the title of each page on the bottom before I started drawing. The raven with a broken wing walked through the scary forest. I drew the raven with a broken wing from behind as she walked between tall trees. Between the trees the shadows stretched, hiding all manner of dangers. The trees seemed impossibly high with their tops dark and unreachable. Hello there, Raven. Don't worry, I can patch that wing up good as new. I will make you a silk sleeve and you can fly once more. I drew a silkworm, poking out of the bark of a tree. No thank you. The Raven with the broken wing continued walking through the scary forest as the silkworm watched her go. Hello there, Raven. Don't worry. I build nests out of grass all day. I can wrap some grass around that broken wing and you can fly above the trees with me where the sun shines. I drew a weaver, 
its bright yellow wings shining starkly against the dark forest behind it. No, thank you. The raven with a broken wing continued walking through the scary forest as the weaver watched her go. Hello there, raven. Don't worry, it might take me a while, but I'll work all day to spin you a nice sturdy web around that wing that nobody can break. I drew a tiny spider, running as fast as he could to keep up with the raven's large steps. No, thank you. The raven with a broken wing continued walking through the scary forest as the tiny spider watched her go. Hello there, raven. Don't worry, we build our nest out of wax, you see. I'm sure me and my brothers can spare some wax for your wing. The skies just aren't the same without you. I drew a fat bumblebee, floating brightly around the raven. No, thank you. The raven with the broken wing continued walking through the scary forest as the bee watched her go. I stared at a blank page for a while, wondering how the story should continue. Perhaps one more well-meaning creature? Which other animals build things? Beavers? What's a beaver going to do though? Build the raven a dam? Dam. My hand is cramping. I never thought that your hand could become unfit. Surprisingly, a few hours had gone by. I paged back a few and saw why. My drawings had more detail than I usually cared to put into them. The bark of the tree the worm was poking out of almost looked photorealistic. The air bent around the wings of the bee, selling the illusion of motion for cheap. The soft shadows behind the multiple legs of the tiny spider were barely perceptible, but added just a touch of realism that gives the story some gravity. I squinted at the page when I realized that the living room was touching on grey. I glanced out the window to see the sky edging on twilight. Almost on cue, the doorbell rang. Three guesses who? Well, at least my pretty underwear won't be wasted on the couch. Oh look, it's you, I said while trying my best not to sound happy. Who else would it be? Alex's smug face beamed at me. Uh, Jehovah's Witness? At least they're easy to get rid of, I replied. I'm hard to get rid of. I linger, like a smile, Alex said through a lingering smile. Or herpes. Just because I'm covered in scabs doesn't mean I have... Uh, just come with me, please, Alex asked, and I repressed a snort of laughter. Fine. I don't even want to know what you have planned for today. I think you'll be unpleasantly surprised. I locked the door behind me and Alex held out his arm for me to hold on to. I walked past him. We got in sadness on wheels and headed in the opposite direction of town. I got an eerie feeling as I realized we were actually heading toward our old school. Are we going to our old school? I asked and Alex seemed to consider it. No. But not a bad idea. It's not an idea, it's a nightmare, I replied. We drove close by our school and into an area I've never visited, even though it's only 10 minutes drive from the house I lived in most of my life. This town is so monotone, however, that it looked indistinguishable from the rest of suburbia. We finally came to a stop across from some forgettable houses. Why would Alex bring me here? He didn't live here as a kid. Does he live here now? If he did, he would have parked in the driveway instead of on the opposite side of the road. Did he bring me to someone? A psychiatrist? An exorcist? I'm hoping for the latter. I don't think I'm possessed, but I've always been interested in testing my acting skills. Here we are, he said as he got out. We aren't anywhere. I got out as well and searched the faces of the houses for any clue as to what I was supposed to be seeing. Alex, instead, was facing the other way. We're at a very special place. I turned around to see a diamond fence with a scrapyard behind it. My mind had seemingly blocked it out of my vision. There were stacks of cars that had seen better days, or better decades, and giant heaps of metal shapes mostly composed of car parts. Alex had his hands on his hips, staring proudly at the mess. It's just the way I remember it, he said. He knelt down and lifted a piece of the diamond fence that had been cut from the rest, making a derelict doggy door. He crawled underneath and turned to stare at me. He gestured me to follow. 
I planted myself staunchly on my side of the fence. There's no way I'm going in there, I said, maintaining a look of confusion and disgust, which is hard to balance simultaneously. Yes, you are. Come on, please, he begged, but only for show. He was already convinced he'd won. I can't win against him. And I hate that. But most of all, I hate that he knows it. I was genuinely curious what I'd find in there. So that's at least part of the reason I crawled underneath the fence. We wandered deeper into the scrapyard between rows of stacked discarded cars covered in rust with occasional patches of paint peeking through. There were heaps of axles and dismantled engines strewn about between occasional stacks of rubber tires. Besides that, there also seemed to be actual stacks of trash. The randomness paired with the pointlessness and temporality of it all gave me an eerie feeling to my core. Are you going to tell me why we're here soon? I finally asked as the uncharacteristically silent Alex was starting to weigh on me. I came here a lot when I was in high school. It's a great place to think. Work some stuff out, you know? No? To me it looks like a great place to get murdered, or seen, and I don't know which is worse." Alex chuckled. I've never seen anyone here. I think it's abandoned, he mused quietly. Oh, great. Even the people who own this place found it creepy and off-putting, but of course Alex the Strange would love it here. Alex shrugged in response. No matter how much I walk through this place. I never feel like I've seen all of it. There are always new places to explore and to see. It's so unknowable and strange. You never know what you might find here. I hate to admit he was right one second after being right, but he was right. As we walked past a heap of trash, I saw beady eyes look up at me. I went toward them and picked up a doll from between the trash. What the hell is that? Alex asked. It's a Wendy doll, I replied. It's ugly as hell, he grimaced. Yeah, I know, and in perfect condition. I had one as a kid, almost exactly like it. For all you know, that could be the exact same doll. Perhaps this is where all the abandoned toys from our past come to plot their revenge, Alex said as if doing a voiceover for an amateur zombie flick. Well, I should let her get back to it then. I said and dumped her back on the heap and resumed walking. Funny. I never could have imagined you playing with dolls as a kid. Well, that is funny. Because I always could imagine you playing with dolls as a kid. I retorted. I did, actually. I blew them up with firecrackers. I have never been less surprised. I don't know. I didn't really take to dolls as my mother hoped I would. It was only when I started drawing on the walls that she gave up on that and bought me some coloring pencils instead. Ah, you weren't the little princess your mom wanted you to be, Alex teased half-heartedly. Guess not. She was holding on to this idea of what I should be for most of my childhood, telling me what girls were supposed to be into and supposed to wear. She let it go a little later on. Perhaps she just accepted me for who I am, or grew tired trying to shove me into a box I don't fit in. Like, I never chose to be this thing, so I don't feel like I have to live up to this thing, you know? I only want to be who and what I choose to be. People might as well tell me that I'm not acting like a proper elephant. To be fair to her, she didn't always teach me that proper girls don't hang out in scrapyards. Such a shame that she's going to realize she was right all along when she finds out her daughter has been murdered in one. You kid? But I once found a gun here. Loaded. Only one bullet missing. Alex exclaimed with unnerving glee. You do know what that means, right? No. It means you haven't found the body. I replied. Alex's eyes stretched wider than ever. Oh. My. Several. God. There must still be a body here somewhere. He shouted in a whisper. Hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is the perfect mafia body dumping spot. Nobody ever comes here, as you said. 
and since the cars get crushed into rubble, there isn't much evidence. I'm sure there's a bunch of cars here with a spooky skeleton in the trunk, I theorized. Alex jumped up and down in excitement, which freaked me out a bit. Then, thankfully, he calmed down. Yeah, I don't think we have mafia on this oversized retirement home of a town. I mean, what would they even do? Sell foot cream in dark alleys? Alex said and stuck his tongue out at me. I'm sure there are enough recreational drug users in this waiting room for a cemetery of a town to keep a decent-sized mafia crime family in business. I mean, there's nothing to do here. What do you think people do all day? Every couple that isn't 700 years old has at least seven kids, Alex replied deadpan. Hmm, good point, I conceded. Speaking of what people do all day, are we going to be here all day? The sun is setting. If we stay much longer, we might run into some criminals with properly moisturized feet. The sunlight spread itself thin over the soil in a pinkish color. Because of how flat this town and surrounding area is, twilight always seems to stretch for a couple of hours. I guess it would be strangely beautiful if I wasn't constantly on the lookout for rabid dogs that might attack us. It would be such a shame if I have to bust Alex's kneecap and leave him for dead. It would really make me feel a little sad for a couple of hours. I really don't get what you want to show me here, unless... Do you live here? I do not live here. Do you live in a scrapyard, Alex? I live in a house with the roof and pleasant smells, thank you. Then what are we doing here? I asked and Alex ignored the question and pointed to a dusty car standing in a clearing instead. Now that looks like a car fit for dumping a body in. 1961 E-Type Jag. What a beaut. Mm, looks like a cockroach, I said and Alex gasped, genuinely offended. How dare dare you? That's my dream car right there. And if there were mafia in this town, they would feel honored to leave a body in the trunk of such a classy car. Alex approached the car and opened the trunk with great effort. I realized that I was more scared of finding out what Alex's reaction to finding a dead body would be than actually finding a dead body. The lack of either a groan of disgust or a squeal of delight informed me there wasn't one to be found. I went toward the driver's seat and got in. The red leather seats were surprisingly clean. In fact, apart from a smell that was slightly off, the car was relatively spotless. Most of the dials in the dashboard seemed to still be where they should be. Some people would say that the car lost its radio, but I'd rather say that it gained a cookie holder. It was missing a steering wheel, but that wouldn't affect the driving prowess of a lot of drivers. The car truly is a ruby among the rough. Alex slammed the trunk closed and walked toward my window. I'm sorry, officer. Was I speeding? I said, doing my best bimbo imitation. Gonna have to see your license, ma'am. Alex replied in a voice that implied he had a two-inch thick mustache and frequently chewed tobacco. I yanked down the front of my shirt and crossed my arms. Oh, officer, I'm terribly sorry I was speeding. Can't we... work something out? I said while my accent drifted a bit south. License, ma'am? Alex repeated coldly. Alex, I don't think you get how this works. I show cleavage, you let me go. Alex paused. You don't have cleavage. I drove my fist into Alex's stomach and he doubled over. That's when his head got hit by a car door and he fell over into a dust cloud. Sorry, I take it back. Alex got out between coughs. You have voluptuous breasts. All hail Jennifer the well-endowed. He pleaded on the ground while backing up as I got out of the car. I'm not Jennifer, but I'll take it. Alex shakily got to his feet. What was in the trunk anyway? Hmm, I'm not quite sure. I fell in and I was in this winter forest with a lamppost and a half-goat half-man telling me that the endless winter should end. So I started a forest fire, Alex said as he ran his hand over the roof of the car. She's in good condition though, Alex whispered. Why are cars always called she? I asked. 
Because they're good for a ride, but occasionally break down. He muttered to himself. Don't hit me! He whimpered and recoiled when he saw my expression. Oh, I'm going to hit you. Just not now. I like to keep up this suspense. I said while feigning a couple of jabs at his stomach. I might not have asked this before, but why are we here? This car is why we're here. Alex finally answered. He got in the driver's seat, rolled up the window, and got out again. We're... going to steal this car? Alex chuckled, then paused. I actually haven't considered that, he said after seemingly mauling it over. He suddenly went to the front of the car and raised the hood. The engine has been removed. I think stealing this car might pose some obstacles, he muttered. Okay, so what are we going to do with it? I really hate that I'm already on board with whatever he wants to do, even if I try to hide it from him. It does look great, though. The black paint is hardly chipped, the seats hardly ripped, the rear view mirrors hardly clipped. Yeah, a ruby in the rough is what I called it in my head earlier. You're different today, I noted. Alex looked at me. What do you mean? You're less... you. You're calmer, more collected, act like you know where you are and what you're doing. You actually seem like you have a brain in your skull instead of a mouse holding a bottle of whiskey and hiccuping through singing show tunes. Well, I... Alex started but paused, considered what I said, nodded approvingly, then continued. Well, I might be a bit more serious. This is a solemn occasion, after all. It is? I told you. This is a special place for me. I spent a lot of time here during high school. Great place to think. To work stuff out. Even if you scream as loud as you can, nobody will hear you. Yeah, that's exactly what you would say if you were planning on murdering me. Alex shook his head. Nah, I usually say something different when I murder someone. What do you say? I scream, WHERE ARE MY COOKIES?! So that they die confused. Alex replied as he walked around, seemingly searching for something. His gaze landed on a pile of rust in the shape of a car barely standing nearby. He shot off towards it and grabbed a metal pipe that was sticking out the window. This should do, he muttered as he tested its swing while walking toward me. He took it in both hands and presented it to me. I bestow this upon thee, he said and almost went down on one knee. All right, and what are we going to do with this? I said as I took it hesitantly. Alex shook his head. Not we. You. And you are going to smash this car. I burst out laughing. You're crazy. I thought you were an idiot, and you are. But you're crazy too. Do it. Trust me. I wouldn't trust you with the life of my Tamagotchi. Besides, I like this car. It might look like a cockroach, but a classy one. Like a cockroach with a suit and a monocle. I said and tried to hand the pipe back to him. He refused. Of course! You have to smash something beautiful. There's no point otherwise. Smashing a pile of rubble would be like... Alex trailed off as he started laughing. Were you going to say, like beating a dead horse? <laughs> yeah. But then I realized that that's where the saying comes from. Yeah, he replied, still laughing. Then turned serious instantaneously. Smash the car. No! Alex sighed so deeply I was worried his lungs would collapse. Why not? Is that a serious question? Yes. Actually it is. What possible good reason could you have for not wanting to smash a car that has no use to anyone? It was a good car. People used it, drove around in it every day, saw some pretty things. Now they're done with it. They put it here because nobody wants it anymore. It might still look like a car, but it isn't. It's a pile of metal. It could still be useful. It still looks good, in good condition. Maybe the world isn't done with it yet, I frantically explained. I couldn't understand why I was defending this car so much. But something in me was fighting desperately against the idea of it being reduced to scrap metal. Alex had his eyes thoroughly rolled up into his skull. 
Fine. Smash one window. Even if someone would still want the car, they could easily just replace the window. Alex said, and I hate it when it makes sense. Just one? Just one. Then we can leave. I've never smashed a window before, I whispered. My mind started to drift. Always looked like fun, didn't it? Alex coaxed. It kind of did, I said, my voice as light as a feather by now. I noticed the car getting closer without even noticing my feet moving. My gaze fixed on the passenger side window. My knuckles turned white from gripping the pipe. But I hardly noticed. Trust me. It feels better than you could ever imagine, Alex whispered and that sent me over the edge. It's just one window, right? It could easily be replaced. I was rationalizing a choice that I've already made. Just... I raised the pipe over my shoulder. Release. I brought the pipe down. Something happened. The tip of the pipe met the perfect center of the window and smashed through. The sound ringing out all around me was satisfying. The jolt through my arm, followed by the surprising ease to swing through it, was satisfying. The glass shards that shot into and out of the car were satisfying. But there was something else. Something happened inside me. Something that I cannot explain. Something unwound. Something that I was so accustomed to I forgot it was there. Now that it gave a little, I was aware of it. A tension, a pent-up angst tied into a knot reaching critical mass. With one swing, the knot unraveled. Just a bit. The relief was palpable, yet unfathomable. It was the same sort of relief when you sit down after walking for an entire day. Almost like getting a back rub after sleeping on a spiral staircase. The sensation was similar, but to a completely different degree. It was like sitting down after walking for, not a day, but an entire year. It was like the first intake of breath after swimming for the surface your entire life. Felt good, didn't it? Alex whispered after a few seconds. I was still staring at the shards of glass with wide-eyed wonder, trying to make sense of what I'm feeling. It did. But I don't know what I'm feeling, I finally replied. That's the feeling of you releasing. And I don't mean you committing the act of releasing. I mean the thing that you are is being released. Were it any other time of day, I wouldn't have cared about what Alex had to say. Standing here in this moment, on this day, I really didn't care what Alex had to say. There was only one thing on my mind. Are we... leaving? I asked like a child would after spending an hour at the free candy store. Hmm, one more window couldn't hurt. Alex answered and they were the most beautiful words I had ever heard. I was already eyeing the backseat window as it reflected the pink sky behind my greedy sneer. I took two steps forward and swung with all my might. I gave it more power this time, swinging with my whole body. I was convinced that I could never swing hard enough, but the harder I swung, the more satisfying the result would be. I heard my own grunt echo back before the window erupted in a beautiful crescendo of destruction. Hundreds of pieces of glass were strewn throughout the air, caught the last rays of the sun and glimmered all around me like a diamond shower. I walked over to the windshield and raised the pipe over my head. WAIT! Alex screamed and I jolted, mainly because I forgot he was even there. Not yet. Trust me, he said and I slyly smiled at him. Because I do trust him. I walked around the car and aimed for the driver's side window. I got better with every swing. My form was better. I swung with more might. Every time I swung the tension unraveled. Every smashed window chipped away at the walls. My body started obeying me better. I felt more in touch with it and the world. I smashed in the window behind it, every time expecting the effect to dampen, but it never did. The knot unravels, the tension unwinds, 
the poison dissipates and the walls crack. It is time now. I walked over to the windshield and raised the pipe over my shoulder like a golf swing. Out of my periphery I could see Alex smiling in anticipation. I screamed as loudly as I could, content that nobody could hear me, but also uncaring. I brought down the pipe with all the strength in my body, putting my heart and soul into one swing. The tip of the pipe came down on the windshield, dead center. As if time was slowed, I could see a wave erupt from that exact point and then propagate outward in a circle until it reached the edges. In a moment, the windshield transformed into a million tiny shards. There were no cracks spreading, no uneven sides. One moment the windshield was one singular pane of glass, the next it was fragments. The shards erupted outward and spread. The crash travelled through the scrapyard and echoed back at us. Pieces of glass grazed my forearms and cheeks, leaving tiny cuts. The pain felt good, because I felt the pain. I drew back. The wave that travelled through the window now crashed onto me and brought me to my knees. I only noticed hot tears streaming over my cheeks because of the sting where it met the cuts. The knots uncoiled. The walls came down in a harsh cacophony of rubble and destruction. I felt relief and solace like never before. I felt layers tearing and falling, like I was climbing out of a dozen shells wrapped around my body. I felt a mask on my face peeling off, heard it clattering to the floor. The curtain opened and revealed the stage. But it was wrong. It was all wrong. The face the mask revealed was more horrifying than the mask itself. The curtain drew to reveal only abomination. I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time, and I'd give anything to go back. Anger and disgust surged within me and brought me to my feet. I rotated to the front of the car and started wailing on the hood. The pipe left ugly, irreparable dents on the once beautiful car. The loud clangs that spewed from it echoed far and wide. The only sound more unnerving were my mangled, strained screams as I was doing it. My knees felt weak and buckled, but somehow I gathered enough strength every time to keep standing and swing once more. I want the car to be a wreck, reduced to nothing but scrap to dust. It was beautiful, and I wanted it destroyed. The dam wall had broken, and I was in the middle of a flood that I could not stand against. Something was raging and erupting out of me that I could not control. Tears cascaded down my face. Blood started to run over my fingers from gripping the pipe too tight. Each hit burst out of me in pulses. I felt my knees grow weaker. The fire that fueled the rage was slowly reducing to embers, and I was choking in the smoke. Whatever escaped from me tired me, and I felt empty. I swayed on my legs, barely keeping me above the ground. The stark silence after the desperate screaming was only displaced with bitter sobbing. The pipe fell from my hands and into a cloud of dust. There was no anger anymore, only uncontrollable sobbing. I staggered toward Alex, but my knees gave out and I fell. Alex darted forward and caught me, his face wrapped up in concern. I cried into his chest. Why did he leave me? I screamed into him. Why? I sputtered through the tears and tried to hit Alex's shoulders with my fist. I wanted to destroy something beautiful. Alex collapsed to his knees, letting me fall into his embrace. He didn't say anything. How could he abandon me? I asked nobody. End of chapter 6. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>